Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Osamu Shimomura, who died recently at the age of 90. Dr. Shimomura was awarded one-third of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, along with Martin Chelfi and Roger Chen, for his discovery of the green fluorescent protein. And we've actually discussed this Nobel Prize in depth because Roger Chin died about two years ago, and I refer you back to the Roger Chin podcast. It's quite informative about green fluorescent protein. Actually, it was Dr. Shimamura who discovered it in the Puget Sound jellyfish. Dr. Chalfi figured out how to insert green fluorescent protein into the roundworm C. elegans, and Dr. Chen figured out many of the medical uses for green fluorescent protein. Here is the description by the Nobel Prize Committee of Dr. Shimamura's work. Some organisms produce what has been named green fluorescent protein, GFP, which emits a shimmering light. The formation of GFP is regulated by a gene that can be incorporated into the genomes of other organisms. Because GFP can be linked to other proteins thanks to genetic engineering, it has become an important tool for studying biological processes in cells. The first steps in achieving this were taken by Osamu Shimamura, who isolated GFP from the jellyfish Aquaria Victoria in the 1960s and found that the protein glowed green when illuminated with ultraviolet light. Here is the awarding of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Dr. Shimamura, Chalfi, and Chen. Osamu Shimamura, who grew up in Japan during the Second World War, discovered the green fluorescent protein in a humble jellyfish from the Pacific Ocean in the early 60s. 30 years later, 1993, Martin Chalfi found against all odds that jellyfish GFP could be put into any organism from bacteria to animals and still fluoresce when illuminated by ultraviolet light. And soon thereafter, Roger Sien engineered a whole palette of fluorescent proteins that shine in all colors of the rainbow. These discoveries and, and developments set off the GFP revolution. And today, these tiny molecular flashlights are used in laboratories across the world to illuminate scientific questions ranging from biophysical chemistry through molecular and cellular biology all the way to ecology and evolution. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations, and I now ask you to step forward to receive the Nobel Prize in Chemistry from the hands of His Majesty the King. Here's his co-laureate, Martin Chalfie, talking about how Dr. Shimamura discovered GFP. Definitely not the usual scientific method, although a lot of times it, it, this is the real way science is done. Osama Shimamura was interested in a fun just a, a wonderful, fundamental question. How is it that some organisms can actually make light? Fireflies, glowworms, bacteria, fungi, crustaceans, and a jellyfish that he was interested in. And this jellyfish produced a wonderful green light, and he tried to understand to find the protein that made that light. So he goes into the lab, he works a very long time, and this is going to be a constant refrain, it didn't work. Nothing worked at all. He goes and he tries and tries and tries. Finally, one evening, he's, wait, he's worked well into the night. He's tired. It's failed again. He takes all the samples. He throws them away in the sink because they're of no use to him. The sink has jellyfish parts and other stuff and some seawater. He turns off the light and he's about to go home when he looks back at the sink and it's glowing brightly. And he goes and he thinks about it and he says, oh, it, seawater, it has calcium. I never had any calcium. He tests that out a couple days later and sure enough, it's calcium. So a complete accident. Throw it in the sink. It's a great way for a Nobel. Here's the University of California explaining how that jellyfish launched a scientific revolution. It turns out that asking a simple question about a jellyfish led to a powerful new tool that's completely transformed research. 
It all began with a simple question. What makes a jellyfish glow? There's a type of jellyfish known as the crystal jelly. A researcher named Osamu Shimomura began studying it in the 1960s, and he discovered a protein in the jellyfish that glows bright green under a UV light. It came to be known as the green fluorescent protein, or GFP for short. Years later, a researcher named Martin Chalfie heard about the green fluorescent protein at a conference. I got very excited and immediately ignored the rest of the seminar and just sat there fantasizing about what would happen if we could possibly take this protein and allow it to be made inside of our worms and look at how things were being made. At the time, he was studying these small organisms called roundworms. There's all this activity going on inside of an organism that's completely invisible to researchers, even with a microscope. Martin realized that he could use GFP as a way to map the inner workings of a roundworm. This was a big deal. Like the invention of the microscope, the x-ray, or the MRI, green fluorescent protein opened up a new world for scientists. They could suddenly see what was happening inside of a cell that had been completely invisible before. But the green fluorescent protein wasn't perfect. It would lose its glow over time, and it wasn't the ideal color for all studies. Here's where UC San Diego researcher Roger Chen enters the story. Roger developed variants of GFP that were brighter and came in a variety of colors beyond green. And uh, we then had to come up with names for these, and upon uh, examination the Crayola website and uh, other consultations, we realized that the simplest, instead of giving them numerical names, were names like monomeric, banana, orange, tandem, dimer, tomato, tangerine, etc., all the way out the plum. This beach scene in a petri dish was made using some of these colorful variants in Roger's lab at UC San Diego. But these glowing proteins aren't just pretty. They allow researchers to mark and observe more than one thing at a time. Researchers at Harvard University use them to color nerve cells in a mouse's brain to see how they form a network. The experiment was called the brain bow. Today, scientists at some of the world's leading hospitals use green fluorescent proteins to study all sorts of diseases. UC Davis uses it for HIV research, while UC San Diego uses GFPs to track breast cancer tumors, and Mass General has used the technology to better understand Alzheimer's disease. When Osamu Shimomura began his research, he didn't know that this jellyfish protein would lead to a scientific revolution. He was just trying to answer a basic question about how our world works. And in 2008, these three researchers won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. One has to wonder how many other secrets there are out there. One of the most interesting things about Dr. Shimomura's story is his background. When he was 16 years old, he was in high school just north of Nagasaki, and he was working on the effort to repair Japanese war material that had been destroyed by the Allies. This is August of 1945, when the second atomic bomb was dropped. I'll let him tell the story from there. You grew up in wartime China and Japan, and indeed you were you were close to Nagasaki when the atomic bomb exploded. Yes, yes I was about 15 kilometers northeast of Nagasaki city. And so you saw the blast, indeed? Well, I saw B-25 heading to Nagasaki. Then, after a few seconds, I saw uh, a very strong uh, flash. I was blinded. And another, about 30, 40 seconds, I had a very strong pressure wave for years. But I didn't know what happened. <laughs> He continued the story by saying that he immediately headed home, and as he was heading home, the entire sky turned pitch black, and soon he was pelted by the notorious black rain, which was the rain mixed with radioactive dust that occurred in the aftermath of the nuclear explosion. When he got home, his grandmother saw him and immediately took him to the bath and washed off all the particulate matter from the black rain. It's quite possible that bath by his grandmother saved his life, because otherwise he would have had a long-term exposure to the radiation dust. And so we can make a case that in part that Nobel Prize is attributable to Dr. Shimomura's grandmother. As he writes in his autobiography after that, they saw B-29s drop two or three parachutes and they heard sporadic gunshots before the dropping of the bomb. Watching carefully, he saw no people attached to parachutes. The morning after the bomb, a technical officer told them that the parachutes they had seen the day before contained measurement instruments and a transmitter. He also mentioned that there was serious damage in Nagasaki, but the details were unknown. The chief of their factory organized a rescue party. They tried to enter Nagasaki, but could not because the roads and the railroad were impassable. 
Later that afternoon, the railroad was opened to Michunu near Nagasaki Station, and rescuers began to transport injured people to Ishaya and other cities. On August 15th, in a radio broadcast, Emperor Hirohito declared unconditional surrender. This was the first time that most Japanese had heard the emperor's voice. I think there was a widespread feeling of relief, he said, and also fear for an uncertain future. Many years passed before we had detailed information about the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Nagasaki bomb was a different type and far more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. Even if the use of the Hiroshima bomb was justifiable in order to precipitate an end to the war, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki three days later was clearly a test of new arms. He felt it could not be justified. Their student mobilization ended, but I was not sure if my school record would allow me to enter college. To receive some guidance, I visited my Ishaya school a week after the end of the war. Attached to the main gate were several sheets of large paper on which numerous names were written. About half of the names were crossed off. Apparently, the school was being used to accommodate the injured people of Nagasaki who were listed on the papers. In the exercise field, several men were slowly strolling under the strong summer sun amid the noisy shrill of cicada. All were half-naked. When I looked closer, I saw that their skin was covered with something black with white specks. I thought it was a black medicine, and I later found out it was dried blood. The white specks were maggots that had hatched on the human flesh. But that was not the most shocking sight. At the front of the gate, bodies covered with straw mats were stacked on a cart, probably to be taken to a crematory. Two people with a stretcher, a body on it, were coming from the school building. At that moment, I noticed two half-naked people standing near the fence. They had been watching the loading of the bodies, a process that might happen to them in a few days. I felt as if I were seeing ghosts. My brain froze, the shrill of cicada faded, and my senses vanished. I think the mental shock I had at that sight when I was 16 years old had a certain permanent effect on me. I regretted for a long time that I did not speak to these people. Probably I didn't have the courage at the time. Years later, at a scientific conference in the United States, he met one of the soldiers whose job it was to monitor the radiation from the machines those parachutes dropped. The soldier was dumbfounded. He could not believe that Dr. Shimomura was a Nagasaki survivor. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. What song to honor Dr. Shimomura with? Well, it has to be something with Green. When we did the Roger Chin podcast, we did an Alan Sherman parody of Green Eyes. I think we'll play it straight here and we'll use one of the most well-known folk songs from the early 1960s, Green Green by the New Christy Minstrels. And if that voice of the guy who's exhorting everybody to sing along sounds familiar, it's because it's Barry Maguire. Only a couple years later, he would leave the New Christy Minstrels for a solo career. He didn't have many hits, but he had one, one of the most legendary songs of the 20th century by P.F. Sloan. When we did the P.F. Sloan podcast, we talked about it. And that's the voice on Eve of Destruction. But for right now, it's our final tribute to Dr. Shimomura with Green Green. Everybody, I want to hear it now. Green Green, it's green that they say, on the far side of the hill. Green Green, I'm going away to where the grass is greener still. To where the grass is greener still. You wear the grass.